So I want to jump into a word today that uh, just kind of got stirred up in my heart last week as I traveled to Greenville, South Carolina with a good friend of mine, and I was in the middle of a service, and if you're a preacher, you know what this is like. I'm just listening to someone else preach, and there's this quick thought that gets thrown out there, and uh, immediately this whole message started stirring up in my heart, and I thought, well, that's for somebody, I guess, and then a few days later, Pastor Mark says, you know, you're going to preach, so I'm going to take that as direction today. But I want to just go ahead and say it to you right from the very beginning, let you know what I'm here to tell you, uh, because we've got a lot of reading to do. The story that I'm going to read from is actually one of the longest stories in the New Testament. Uh, Luke is a man of detail. He's a little long-winded. He wrote not only this gospel, but he wrote Acts as the sequel. And so he puts a lot of eyewitness account in what he's doing because he was building a case for a man named Theophilus. And so we've got a lot of ground to cover. But let me just go ahead and say this to you. When you're following Christ, any defeat that you experience is not actually defeat. It only has the appearance of defeat. That's the big idea. That when you follow Jesus, what feels like a defeat is actually only the appearance of defeat. It has all of the outward characteristics of defeat. And by all natural reasons, you would just respond like most people do to situations that come across in your life where you have every reason to be down, depressed, and without hope. But we in Christ have a greater hope in the future, which is to come. So whenever we experience loss, hardship, trial, persecution trial by fire, test of various kinds, we could respond as everyone else responds in despair, but we know that we are not a part of a kingdom that suffers defeat, only the appearance of defeat. I want you to look at this story right here with me. Starting at verse 13, it says, That very day, what is that very day? That very day is the third day after the crucifixion, the day that Christ Jesus resurrected from the dead. Two of them, two of who? Two of his disciples were going to a village named Emmaus. This was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. What things? The things that they had not expected. They had believed that Jesus was going to reestablish the kingdom of David but he had not. And he had been crucified by the Romans, the ones who these Jewish people despised because they were under their rule and thumb. And they thought Jesus was coming in the lineage of David to free them from that Roman rule. So they're talking and discussing these things together. Jesus, who has now resurrected but not yet ascended, draws near to them and went with them. But their eyes were kept... From recognizing him. There were three accounts in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus appeared to his disciples, people he walked with for three years while on the earth, but at their initial greeting, they did not recognize him physically. And this is one of those accounts. And he says to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here, that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped, remember that phrase, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's a Bible study I would have loved to have been a part of. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. 
And he acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened uh, to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord has risen indeed and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Lord, bless the reading and proclamation of your word this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yesterday, Pastor Mark and I Sat and watched some of the games, got to watch Georgia pull it through right there at the end. What a great defensive play we had right there at the end of the game last night. And uh, that's right, amen. A lot of deception up here um, when it comes to team loyalty. I just wanted to start off by saying that. Here's one of the things I learned. I played football my whole life. I love watching football, but even last night I was trying to think about this morning and kind of watch the game with one eye and study with the other. But there were moments when I'm sitting there, and it probably seems weird to people because I'm completely quiet, but I'm listening to the game. And every time something happens, I don't want to happen. I'm like, come on! And just really random and from silence because <laughs> I'm listening and watching what's going on. But what I've learned uh, with this game is that if you really invest your heart into it, man, it, it has the, the possibility of just giving you such great joy Amen. and such terrible sorrow in the same season. I remember back when I was in seventh grade and we were playing for the region championship. This is a middle school championship. I was playing for the South Effingham Mustangs. And we were playing against our county rivals, the North Effingham Rebels, in the region championship as seventh graders. And um, This was a big deal, obviously. We were middle schoolers, seventh graders. We had went undefeated so far in this season. And we get to the region championship, and because we were undefeated, we hosted the regional championship at our home stadium in front of all these people who come out to the community. And here's what was so crazy. We were playing in the high school stadium, which was something we had never been able to do before. So we already felt big. We felt like we were playing grown up. We felt like we were in high school playing like all the other older players that we idolized every week that we went to watch on Friday night. But then to our surprise, the administration of the middle school and high school had gotten together and right before the game started, the high school marching band, which is a nationally just recognized band all across the country. People know the South Devon Kim Mustangs come rolling into the stadium playing the South Effingham fight song. So they surprised us, and the high school band came and played for a middle school championship game. It was just so, gives me chills sitting here thinking about it. It was, it was amazing. But here's the, here's the long story short. We lost that game in double overtime, double overtime, and we lost it by a yard. I, have, I don't think I've ever cried that hard in my life. And I remember our principal walking up to us and uh, looking at us and just, he had nothing to say. I mean, there was nothing to make us feel better about the heartbreaking defeat that we experienced. And some of you, even if you didn't play football, you've had moments like this. Like if you're a, uh, <clears throat> an Alabama fan, a couple of years ago, there was a play where they thought the game was won and there was a field goal attempt. I don't know if anybody remembers this. And the Auburn Tiger caught the ball in the end zone and returned it 99 yards for a game-winning touchdown against the Alabama Rolls. Get it. (laughs) (laughs) Front row says, move on. Founding pastors say, get to the point, get to the point. That was one of the most heartbreaking, most memorable moments in college football. I mean, I remember sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh, if that had been my team, oh, that would have been hard to get over. And I remember games like it. I mean, there was a game in, I think, 2005 or 2006 where Kentucky was playing the Tennessee Volunteers. 
and Tennessee thought, excuse me, Kentucky thought they had the game won. They had already poured the Gatorade on their coach. And the very last play of the game, the very last play of the game, Tennessee returns the kickoff for a touchdown, and they beat, and the, the losing coach is standing there dripping <laughs> with Gatorade. See, there's this thing that they teach you when you play football. They teach you, don't tempt fate. Don't, Amen. don't test the football gods. Amen. Until that last whistle blows. Play through to the very, I mean, this is something they teach you as a little kid. They say, play until the whistle blows. Do not stop. Don't stop running your feet. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because there's this thing that seasoned football players know that anything can happen if you just keep working. If you just keep going and you've got to make sure that you finish strong. Because in the game of football, you never know what could happen. And I, I say all of that just to, just to pause for a moment and say that in this walk with Christ, it is, so, it is so important that we have the right perspective and the right mode of heart and the right mode of life and the right approach to hardship, trial, and suffering. Because if we somehow get fooled into thinking that we are defeated by the various circumstances that we face in this life, we will find ourselves acting like we're losing a game we've already won. See, one of the things that happens when you do play football and the game starts getting out of hand is you'll notice some physical responses coming from the losing team. If you watch them, their pace gets a little slower they start drooping their heads. They start putting their hands on their hips. They just kind of start going through the motions, in a sense, to get the game over because they have given up. They've given up. The sadness of their situation has caused them to stop performing or walking as they should or playing like they should because they have forgotten that in the game of football, Anything can happen. And even more so, in our walk with our Savior, what is impossible for us is possible with God. And in this story, what you see is you see two people who were followers of Jesus, how long we don't know, but you see them in an obvious state of defeat. They're walking, saddened, and having a conversation about what had happened when the Romans killed Jesus. And Jesus interrupts their conversation. And my prayer this morning, honestly, for anybody in this room that's going through any kind of trial, any kind of hardship, you've made a mistake. Someone you love made a mistake. Someone has hurt you. You've hurt somebody. Whatever it is that you're going to be reminded this morning of something that is so important to be reminded of, who Jesus really is. Because let me tell you what gets you into despair when you take your eyes off him and put your eyes on your situation. When you take your eyes off Christ and you put your eyes on this apparent poverty that we're a part of being under the Roman rule. We're so focused on our current situation that we are blinded by the fact that this man who said to us many times that he would resurrect from the dead has been in the grave for three years. We've already forgotten that on many occasions he said to us, tear this temple down and I will rebuild it. And although he's been in the grave three years, we've already discredited him as the Messiah that many of us were proclaiming proudly through the city streets we grew up in to the people we grew up with. We've already forgotten this thing that we were so passionate about just a week ago. Because the severity of the situation we're in has caused us to doubt the credibility of the Savior we follow. The severity of the situation we're in has caused us to doubt the credibility of the Savior we follow. And isn't this exactly what happens to every one of us? We forget how this thing has been laid out. We forget that we know the ending. We forget that we've already been shown how the game ends. And when we suffer 
a hardship, when we suffer a trial, when we suffer a persecution, we suffer something that's very difficult, it becomes our centerpiece and our focus. It becomes the thing that we, 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 we orbit this thing in our life. It becomes our complete focus. What he says is that you've got to remember who I am. And he shows us here a few ways that that can happen. And I love them. The first one, he goes and talks with them and he identifies their first problem. He asks them, what's the deal? Why are you sad? What are you talking about? And the, man respo- the man's response is, you know, are you the only one in Jerusalem who has not heard about these things which have been taking place? And then he says, no, why don't you tell me, clarify, what things? And in verse 19... He says, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, who was a prophet, a man who was a prophet, past tense, mighty indeed, word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one, we had hoped that he was the one, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. How many of us have had this thing in front of us, almost like this carrot out front of us in our walk with Christ where we thought, man, by loving and serving Jesus, one day, one day this will be true. One day my marriage will be fixed. One day I will be out of debt. One day I will be healed of this disease. One day my kids will serve God again. One day, one day, one day. We had hoped, we had hoped, we had hoped that by following Jesus and putting our trust in him that he was going to give us what we wanted. We had hoped by following Jesus that eventually the thing that we wanted, the thing that we were hoping for all along would be accomplished, but it didn't happen the way I thought it would happen. How many times have you been in the middle of something, maybe you're in it right now, where it's just not going the way you thought it should go? It isn't happening the way you predicted it would have happened or even preferred that it would have happened. But you in the back of your mind know that he is God and he's in control. And although he seems late, he is always on time. But the emotions of the moment that you find yourself in are causing you once again to doubt the credibility of the Savior you follow because of the severity of the situation that you're in. But here's what I want to show you today. This is the response that Jesus has to them, although they had a misunderstanding of who he was, he lovingly walks with them. So if you're in here today and you feel defeated, you feel at a loss, you feel like you're losing, it's for one reason and one reason only. You have misunderstood the fullness of the person of Jesus. If you think you're losing, if you think what has recently happened to you or what happened to you a year ago that you cannot get over, if you think you're losing, it's because you've misunderstood him. But here's what's so amazing is that he walks with us. In fact, he walks alongside of us And he says, I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to show you who I am. If you just keep walking, I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to reveal my character to you in a more clarified way. And as you become more clear about who I am, all of a sudden it's going to put everything in perspective. You know, if you've been through any real suffering, I mean, if you've really been through the stuff that brings you to your knees, when you read the New Testament, And it says things like, you should rejoice in the midst of fiery trials. You could almost be offended by that. Anybody with me in the room on this one? You could almost be offended by that. Rejoice in the midst of fiery trials. What would give God the ability to say something like that to us? Well, first of all, he's God, but we're all talking on a human level right now. So let's just break it down. Let me tell you why he's able to say such a thing so confidently. But not just him. 
Why were the disciples, the ones who wrote the New Testament, so confident to say such a thing to not only the followers who received those letters at first, but all of the future followers that you and I are numbered among? It's because they knew that they were not defeated. That although they were perplexed, they were not driven to despair. Although they were mourning, joy comes in the morning. That although they were crushed, they were not crushed by what was going on in their life. They knew that He was coming again. And that anything that was happening in their life had to be weighed against eternity. Matter of fact, Paul says this. He says that these light momentary afflictions that you are going through cannot compare to the eternal weight of glory. So for God to say to you and I that we should be able to face what appears to be like to defeats in our lives as winners, as people who have positive outlooks, optimistic words, life speech, the reason He could say things like that to us is because He has guaranteed eternity for us. And he has said that although what you're going through in this life feels heavy, heaven is heavier. There's coming a moment where all things will be made new. Every tear will be wiped away. And what I have done by my resurrection, I have secured for you. The same spirit that awakened my three-day dead body is the spirit that dwells within you. And it is a deposit and a guarantee that a day will come that you will be given a new body. Corruptible will put on incorruptible. Natural will put on spiritual. Perishable will put on imperishable, and you will be transformed in the air into the image of Christ Jesus for all eternity, and you will be met in the air by a great cloud of witnesses, those who were dead and those who were alive in Christ. You will be with me for eternity, and everything that has confused you in this life will make sense in a moment. That's his promise. The reason why he says we can be joyful even in the midst of suffering is because it's not over. So he says, I want to walk with you and I want to clarify for you who I am. And they go on to describe what has taken place. And this is what's so powerful right here. The very first thing they say is that he is not who we hoped he was. This is a statement of interpretation. They believed that he was the Messiah that was promised Through the Old Testament, they believed that he was the one coming in the lineage of David to redeem them from the rule and thumb of the Roman Empire. But when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate asked him this same question. Pilate had this same assumption. He said, are you a king? Jesus' response is that my kingdom is not of this world. If it had been, my servants would have already rescued me from your clutches. In fact, the authority that you have over me is actually not real authority. It's only the appearance of authority. My father gave you this authority. You're a pawn in the plan. There's a purpose at work within my suffering. I was sent for this very purpose. I'm going voluntarily to this cross. Although you feel like you're making an order, you were ordered before the foundation of the world. This was predestined and planned before you ever even had the ability to make a decision. Now you think you're the one making it. In fact, one has been making it for you even before you existed. And he's putting this this reality out front of you and I, showing us how much he is in control. And these guys right here had the assumption that because the Romans crucified him, he was defeated. But all along, Jesus had taught the message of the kingdom that his kingdom was not of this world. So what is it that you and I have to do to find the right understanding of Jesus? We have to discover who he is by his word. It's too simple. It's profound, but it's too simple. We have to discover who Jesus is by his word. Most of us open his word on a daily basis and we just feel confused by what we read. We open it and it feels like we're reading the newspaper. We don't have proper context. We don't even really know the players. We don't know who the person is they're talking about. And we just read quickly and feel accomplished because we did our religious duty. But in reality, what God wants is there to be a desire 
for his word. When you look at how it all began, we were given the law, and then the prophets come and say, remember to keep the law, but then the psalmist and the wisdom comes, which says, love the law. And write it on the fleshly tablets of your heart. God wants us to desire to obey his commands. They're not meant to be burdens. As a matter of fact, those who are born of God obey his commandments. And we are known to be his children by the fact that we obey his commandments because they are not burdensome to the children of God. Because we have a desire to follow him, to love him, to obey what his word says. So there is a discovery which takes place in his word. And there's three things that the word tells you to do when it comes to the reading of God's word that make it so that it sticks with you, so that it's written on the tablet of your heart. The first thing is, is memorization. We are told all throughout scripture to memorize his word. And then as we memorize, we meditate. We memorize and then we meditate. And then when we memorize and meditate, we apply. And as we memorize, meditate, and apply, we experience one of the greatest things that you can experience being a friend of the Holy Spirit, which is special revelation. Memorize, meditate, apply, and through walking with the friendship of the Holy Spirit, you experience one of the greatest gifts we have in this life, which is special revelation. And it's tested by the authority of the written scripture. Because here's the thing, you can't open your Bible and say, should I go here or should I go there? Should I marry him or should I marry him? Should I marry her or should I marry her? Should I go this way or that way? The Bible doesn't answer those questions for you, but the friendship of the Holy Spirit walking with you does, and it's tested by the authority of God's Word written on your fleshy tablet of your heart. And because you study God's Word, which is the prophetic fulfillment of Christ and the prophetic foreshadowing toward Christ, you begin to know Him more deeply, and by knowing Him more deeply, you know yourself better, and by Knowing yourself better, you know your purpose. And as you know your purpose, you walk those things out. And the Holy Spirit just keeps on moving you through every one of those things. So the very first thing Jesus is going to do with them is give them the proper interpretation of the word. If you know his word, you know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you know his word. And he says, you can understand who I am by the knowledge, the increasing knowledge of who Jesus is. But just knowledge alone is not enough. It has to be the love that you find that I have for you in my word. Love builds us up and knowledge puffs us up. So he walks with them and gives them this proper interpretation. But in their explanation, they reveal something else that's equally important. They say, some women from our group had said that they saw the empty tomb and that angels had appeared to them and that they said he was alive. And they obviously didn't believe it because they're walking sad and they're talking about Jesus in the past tense. So what does that mean? That means that these folks, these two men, they didn't have much confidence in the experiences of other people. I would tell you that one of the ways that I have come to know and love Jesus in more powerful and deep ways is by knowing him through the experiences of other people. Not only am I growing in my relationship with Jesus by studying his word and showing myself approved and finding the depths of his character by what he revealed through all human history over 1,500 years by 40 different authors, but I am also witnessing the evidences of his grace in the lives of other people. I walk closely with other believers, and when I walk closely with other believers, not only do I experience the evidence of His grace in their lives, but the things I believe about His Word are challenged. This is the support way of living for the believer because when I am alone studying His Word, I can come to some pretty weird conclusions all by myself. But when I am able to walk side by side with someone else, Iron sharpens iron, and the things that I believe or the conclusions I come to are tested by His Word. But not only that, the things that I discover in His Word are confirmed and empowered because of the things I see God do in the lives of other people. So your testimony, the things that have happened for you, the things you believe, the things that God has done in your life, they are powerful and they are meant to be shared. They're powerful and they're meant to be shared. So we discover who Jesus is through his word. We see who Jesus is through the evidence of other people's lives. And the way Jesus wraps this whole thing up is he gives them, he gives them almost like a rebuke. 
He calls them foolish and slow of heart to believe. He gives them this, almost like this summary of things. He says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He shows them that all through the salvation history that's recorded in scripture, that people went through some type of suffering, but came out on the other side victorious because they trusted him, because they trusted God. The Bible is filled with the people who said yes to God. How many people said no and were forgotten? How many people in human history did God approach with the possibility of his purposes being fulfilled in their life and they simply said no? That in the midst of their hardship and trial, they gave up or gave in or believed that they were defeated. He's saying, is it not so that the Christ should have suffered like all have before us but came through victorious? That in the same way an axe head floated and that God's people walked across on dry ground that their wagons would not get stuck. The Son of Man is three days in the heart of the earth like Jonah and is resurrected to life. Is it not so that the Christ should have suffered that he also would be raised to glory? How is it that God glorifies us in our life? How is it that we can taste the sweetness of victory even now in this world when we face so many various despairs by keeping our eye on Christ and knowing that the same spirit that resurrected him from the dead is that which lives in me and greater is he, than me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. That I can have joy in my trial. This is why James says, Blessed are those who remain steadfast. Blessed are those who remain steadfast under trial because the testing of their faith in those moments prove them to have genuine faith. Like gold thrown in a blacksmith's fire, the impurities of your character rise to the surface in the pressure of the situation and God uses it to remove those things which are hindering you from having the greatest hope which is in Christ Jesus. So the pressure it produces character, it produces endurance, it produces all the things that we need for life and godliness. It trains us in godliness. And the last thing I want to tell you, and then I'm done, is what these men say. They say to each other when Jesus leaves them, they say, did your heart not burn within you as he spoke? Did your heart not burn within you as he spoke? But here's what I love, and I love the fact that we participated in this today. A lot of people skip over this point, and I think it's very important. It says that they did not recognize him through this entire seven-mile walk until the moment he broke bread with them where they were staying. And when they broke bread, when they shared communion, their eyes were opened to who he was. And he vanishes from their sight. It's, It's a miraculous story. But I love what they said to him even before, even before he left. They said, stay with us. Stay with us. And when he had vanished from their sight, they said, man, did your heart not burn within you as he spoke? So I'm discovering who Jesus is through his word. And the Holy Spirit enlightens me to its truth that I can know him deeper. I'm discovering who Jesus is through the experiences of other believers. I'm listening to their stories and watching the evidences of grace in their life and applying those powerful things to my own. But lastly, and these are not in order priority, I am spending time in his presence where there is this cry of my heart that says, Lord, when I'm in your presence, my heart burns within me. Stay with me. Let your presence rest over me. Let your presence go with me everywhere I am. I want to know that you're there walking with me. I want to know that you're there with me. And this is what we see in this, is that through the personal, intimate devotion of a Christ follower, I discover greater things about who God is by spending time with him alone in the simple spiritual disciplines of solitude, fasting, prayer, worship, that I see God more clearly. I behold his glory And I become his image from glory to glory to glory. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you real quick. Father, we love you today. Help us not to be driven to despair. Help us not to have the appearance of defeat. Help us not to be sad standing still in our walk with Christ. But help us, Lord, 
to continue forward. Help us to know you better and deeper by your word. Help us to know you better and deeper by the experiences of others, by living life and doing life with other believers. Help us finally, Lord, to discover more about you by just being alone with you, by doing what the word says and being in the secret place, by staying before your feet, by staying before your throne in the secret place where our hearts are set on fire. Keep us in front of you. Keep us at your feet, worshiping in private devotion. Help us, Lord, to put these things into practice in our life. Help us to follow these simple steps of spiritual discipline that we would know you deeper, we would know who you are, and that we would walk victorious, that we would walk knowing that it's not over, that any suffering, hardship, or trial that we face in this life is only the appearance of defeat, but there is a greater victory coming in our eternity spent with you. We love you, we thank you, and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.